today. Uh, we're going to be doing some Go coding as well, but there's I'm taking questions from beginners. Um, and we're, right now we're going over what uh, are the right tools for the job. But we have this question uh, coming in here. And let me see if I can read it. Complexity is a novice programmer. I'm like a new seed turtle hatching just newly bought, brought into this world. I have no way to how to make it. And I have to make it to the sea. If I try to take on a seagull too fast, it'll eat me. And if I go too slow, then I won't get killed. So how do I determine my level so I can progress with steady rate? That took almost a full replay clip. I think, I think the way that you'll feel more comfortable is when you get more targeted in and focused in on what you need to do. Like when you start finding exact jobs that interest you, it'll start to shave away all the complexity of things that you have to learn. And you can focus on only the things that you need to learn. And by need to learn, what I mean is... Like, for example, I have shaved away a ton of stuff uh, from the boost so that I'm not teaching like web development. I'm teaching general you know, HTML and that. But we're focused only on infrastructure engineering jobs, the kind of systems jobs that I like. Okay, I, if you want to be a game dev, I just have to tell you that I pity you. And I know that people think they want to be game devs. I certainly did. But look into what game developers actually do and the hours they put in and how much they get paid and, and their rates of suicide and shit like that. I would be really careful about that decision. Sounds really discouraging, but it's like really, really bad. People think they want to get into coding because they like game development. And I, I actually started a company where I would lure people in with game development and then I would show them all the other things in development that are out there, like, you know, hacking infrastructure and web development and everything. And they'd end up doing that instead. I'm like, oh my God, this is so much better. Make sure you're single. Make sure you don't have much of a life outside of game development and the people that you want to work with and that you don't mind being like really, really railed on because they're going to force you to do long hours for very little money. They're going to burn you out and they don't care. And if you don't believe me, just look at Bethesda Maybe. individual game development. And I've had a lot of people who like game development, and I encourage you to seek game development as a hobby. But then do something that's in a similar vein using the languages you like in you know in your main job so that you can do that by night. He you know? was like a vigilante hacker by night, but he worked his mainstream job during the day to make the money and pay the bills and stuff. I feel like that will give you a better life balance and who knows, you might sell your indie game and become like crazy rich off the extra money, but you'll have insurance at the same time. You know, I stream on my own and I make okay money as a streamer. I'm not, there's no way I can ever support myself on it, but I enjoy it more because it's something I get to do and contribute. And then I can still, you know, make sure my family is fed and has insurance and everything. Or through contribution to projects on GitHub, what's the meaningful way for someone to add value to a project? How would a new be useful for one of yours, for example? Well, that's good because I just started a project, uh, Fluff, which I want to talk about in a second. Uh, and the answer is, the answer is short. start with documentation. Start with this stuff, the low-hanging fruit that nobody wants to do. Start with the test cases. Start with typo validation. Start with that stuff because there's going to be issues in there that people are going to need and they're not going to want to spend time on it. That's the best way to kind of get your feet in the door. Uh, another really good way to get in the door is to start taking the product and testing it out. It's really hard to get people to do user acceptance kind of testing. Like you are a user and you are doing the testing and you are, you know, providing feedback for channel of the developer community, get really acquainted with the application and start answering questions for people. And I've noticed that people in our community have done that, that very thing. Aug comes to mind. Um, our friend who is helping us with Pegan as well. It's, it's a way, you know, get, get embedded in the community by helping. Don't necessarily have an idea of what other people do out there. So you need to go to conferences, not, you know, conferences, you need to go to local meetups. You don't need to pay a lot of money. You need to go find streamers and YouTubers, people who actually work doing the thing you do and make connections. You have to stay connected Please. in this. Uh, if I have containers in Docker, I want to get them into Kubernetes. So, the best way to do this is to just experiment. This is why I'm making fluff for this kind of thing. So we can have actual systems that have, you know, that have containers that you can put them in. You know, the process of, of, of estimation on the size of a container and Kubernetes and all that stuff is really hard to do. There's, it's one of the hardest parts of Kubernetes to do. Uh, the best thing is just trial and error and setting up Kubernetes clusters. I've been accused of this. I want to read this question because I've been accused of this a lot. Why are there so many communities that are really condescending toward beginners? Everyone asks stupid questions from time to time, even if they search on the internet for hours. I and mean, I get it. Isn't that what it makes someone a beginner? I absolutely agree, but there's an important caveat to that. And I want to make sure you understand that. The caveat is this. 
if you have not even lifted a finger to do any of your own research, something I call intellectual laziness, you will get roasted by most communities, including learning communities, because they expect you to put the time in to do your own learning. Of everybody. You don't ever want to go join a community that's just going to hand you all out of the answers and create a, a core dependency on that community for all the answers. When, and you know, teach a man to fish instead of, you know, give him a fish or whatever. Person who's know. going to the person's cubicle and saying, hey, dude, how do I do X and Y? And it says, let me Google that for you. People get pissed at that and they should get pissed at that and they should push back on you to make you go back. So please, so I completely agree. You know, everybody's a beginner and yoga, they have a thing called beginner mind. Beginner mind is when you all just know that you're beginners and God knows we are. I mean, God, how, how many mistakes have I made in Linux? How many things have I learned from streaming on Linux, uh, you know, about Linux and these types of things? I am learning constantly and it's because, and I'm constantly feeling like a beginner. That's why I like Linux. I'm never, I'm never not yeah, a noob. That's so great about Linux. Linux humbles all of us. All of us are noobs when it comes to Linux. You think you're really good at this? Okay. How about trying some kernel development? Oh, you think you're good in this? Oh, how about this? You know, oh, let me show you this, this alias you never even fucking heard of. I mean, I love that about Linux. It makes us all noobs and we can join in the pain and suffering and wonderment of it all the together. Structure with Windows is awesome. I wish I had had that when I was beginning to study this stuff at the beginning. I jumped into Linux and learned to work here by suffering. Last week, I tried to boot my old Windows laptop. It was painful. So I'm back on Linux. I had a lucky work to a company here in Brazil that works full time with Linux. So I don't really miss Windows. I think that's phenomenal. And I think it's so awesome that people are able to use Windows uh, or Linux, sorry, at the desktop. It's just not what most people can do. And I've said that over and over and over again. So I have to keep saying it because our, you know, Linux friends, including they, and I would be the one saying, it. it's like, no, you're wrong. You're wrong. You can do them. Just. So if you get it fine, if you don't build them a fire, if you, if you want them to be warm for the rest of his life, set them on fire. Oh, this is a much better take on that whole thing. If you want a man to be warm for a night, build him a fire. If you want a man to be warm for the rest of his life, set him on fire. <laughs> I love it. I feel absolute beginners get turned off by that. You know what? You got to have a thick skin if you're going to be an autodidact. Autodidact, and that goes for me too. People are going to tell you shit. They're going to make fun of you and everything. You have to throw all of that off and just continue to learn. Don't get mad get busy learning and it's, it's hard to do but it's true do you think any of the greatest innovators in history got pissed off because somebody gave him shit and said hey that's stupid you shouldn't pursue that there's that whole thing where they're going to make fun of you then they're going to kind of accept you and then they're going to you know pay you and envy you LTM Bob says it took uh it took me a while to get to the point where I didn't take people's opinions personally then I realized that's just their opinion not the truth of the matter and that goes for me that goes for anybody Right. I think you should listen to everybody, but ultimately you're your own boss. You're going to make your own conclusions. I think, yeah, I think most people know that. They don't need to really be told that. They just need to be reminded. My hardest thing is having a really strong opinion that I can let go of. And that's dogma, right? We get, a, we get really dogmatic about our discoveries or our preferences or our opinions when a scientific way would be to dismiss those things in the face of new information, such as WSL2 on Windows. It's okay to use a web browser or to try things out. Um, on company time on your own personal machines. What's not okay is for you to work on proprietary projects on those systems. And I think there's a really important distinction. People keep telling me, why don't you use Amazon Desktop? Why don't you use this? Why don't you use pair programming? Why don't you use Git, Git Squid or whatever? All of these internet dependent things. And I had two, two days ago, I had a five hour power outage. And if I hadn't had this stuff running on my desktop at home, I couldn't have done any work because there was no internet. Enterprise is fucking idiotic. And I actually did this. I learned this lesson the other way. I was teaching a private school. The private school had 45 people in it. They had really shitty internet. None of them used Repl.it. I had to redo everything with VS Code and had them downloaded at home and come back the next day so we could get work done. That's the reality. We're made in our time, other than Linux, which is Git probably, is that you are you have a copy of all the stuff you need to do, and then you check it in when you have a connection. In other words, there's no dependency on any connection, anything. You're on an airplane, you can get work done. If you if you build in a dependency on the internet, you're a fucking it's fool. Fair to say that some jobs can't be done without the internet because the systems that you're hosting and maintaining are in the internet. They're in the cloud, right? There's a lot of cloud work that requires that, but applications development, operations engineering, stuff like that. Some of those jobs do require that you have internet all the time, but a large percentage of them don't. And particularly if you're testing infrastructure, there's no place like home. How do you keep yourself protected from these problems, right? You set up localized virtual environments and you set up local LAN stuff. 
And people that have been in tech for an amount of time know how to do this because this is what they do to, to be to survive because they have to be able to get work done. There's a number of specific technologies that are involved. Obviously, is virtualization. You have to be able to virtualize machines at home on your laptop or whatever, and that's the you know the motivation behind Fluff and, and VMware and Workstation and those kinds of things. So that's the first thing. The second one is Git. You need to be able to use Git. Those are the, really the two technologies that I would say are the most important. Um, that's it. You know, if, because you can do work outside of that. You need, oh, Docker. Sorry, Docker containers. Right. You need to be able to do Docker and stuff like that. So you can you can do your containers locally. And you really need this team's dependency. Like they can't do their job unless they have putty. Um, and uh, there's going to be tasks that they cannot do unless they have SSH access into the servers because that's what they're administering. They're administering servers in the cloud, right? But a lot of their tasks can be done on separate emulated systems and then put into the cloud later. This job, particularly infrastructure engineering, you should get good at at your own little lab and messing with it and, and, and make a little home piece of that lab on your computer itself with a lot of cores and RAM so that you can run virtual machines on your own computer, even if you're not at the lab. Uh, or is it based on a foundation so you can do whatever like game dev or devops and the question is relevant uh the answer is yes um it will allow you to do everything and not some things and let me just say what that means uh so what i mean by that is that you cannot say what skills you're going to need in tech until you know what kind of job you're going for but there's a certain set of skills that apply to everything and i personally believe linux bash terminal cloud skills apply to all modern jobs and technology benefit that much from learning linux and and the terminal and all of this stuff hacking however would really benefit from it cloud native of course would really benefit from it web development would benefit if you're going to be full stack web developer then it would definitely benefit from it uh but probably not game dev linux terminal above all uh you have to do that docker above all uh cloud is is Linux with containers, SSH, Linux terminal, and you know learning how to edit remotely from VI. Cloud native, which is just using all the technology that's used by cloud providers and cloud. Cloud is usually means I am using a cloud provider like Amazon, AWS, or GCP or whatever. Uh, that's a really important distinction going into it. I prepare people to do cloud native engineering. We have some people that are asking questions about you know getting frustrated. Uh, you suggest making a list of things to start to make projects with small projects and then build up on your confidence towards a larger project. I cannot overstate my agreement with that. Aug really has been helpful in getting people that confidence and I appreciate it here. So the, this is a pretty new conclusion. We're going to have you install Windows Terminal or iTerm 2. Uh, one's Windows, one's Mac. We're going to have you install VMware Workstation Fusion or VirtualBox. We're going to have you download our new fancy tool called Fluff, and, and we're going to have you fluff up a local cloud of virtual machines and then connect to it with SSH. The reason we're going to do that is because this is going to give you uh, a true sense of, of how you would connect to a cloud server. It will feel like you're dealing with cloud servers and you're connecting to them. Eventually, we will do Docker, but not right away. The biggest substantial changes from last year uh, is that we will not be starting with Docker. We'll be starting with a virtual machine instead so that you can deal with things like making your own disks uh, and, you know, be safer. It's a safer environment than Docker since Docker uses your host environment. So we'll still learn Docker, but we'll learn it after VM day. Uh, the quick answer is I don't think you should use any of those things. I think you should use a cloud init provider, uh, a cloud. In other words, I think you should use uh, a Debian-based distro, Ubuntu server, or a Red Hat distribution of some kind to get going because you don't need to go. Uh, the fact of the matter is is that 90% of the, of the Linux work that you would be doing doesn't have a GUI and therefore it's kind of a, a waste of time and resources to do that. And and I don't think it's worth investing your time at all in it. I think you should learn how to do it from the command line using the shot here because 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 Ruby because Vagrant's got a bunch of technical debt. Ruby's got you know it's got a bunch of technical debt. It has to support Ruby. Uh, the guy who did HashiCorp had to come out and say, "Hey, get ready. We're not get ready for the new Vagrant, but guess what? We're not going to break the old syntax files. Don't you worry. That's technical debt, and that bogs the project down. Tab. We are not supporting any operating system distro that does not support cloud init. If it does not support cloud init, it is not included by default. There's no place that we need to register. You just point at a URL of a Kimu uh, file and you're good to go. Because this really does have the potential to get rid of ISO installs completely. 
we could just use, if we do clouded images, they're already disk images and we just put them in and go. There's no, there's no ISO. There's no problematic not working. Oh, I did this wrong kind of thing. You just get an image that works and you initialize it with clouded. Yeah. You know what? I'm kind of glad I did. I'm not kind of glad. I'm really glad I came out of retirement. I'm glad I, I mean, it wasn't really retirement, right? I was working my ass off for myself, but I'm really glad I'm working in the enterprise again because it's, it's actually reinvigorated me with all these concerns of the enterprise that I was not plugged into wait, before. Mouse click, wait, repeat, mouse click, wait, repeat. Now it's a cloud in it world. Thanks to Ubuntu. You know, I can, I can shit on Ubuntu for failing to give us a good desktop OS, but guess what? They gave us cloud in it. So, you know, so that's Hi, good. Chris. I mean, don't you agree? God, somebody like you, <laughs> when Chris Nova like quotes me, I want to listen and pay attention. I mean, come on. You're not a provider unless you fulfill the full interface. <laughs> so I appreciate you saying yeah. so. Um, yeah. Are you doing right now? I'm just testing a Git Go repo. So if you want to pay attention, if you want to make a Go repo really quick, the stuff I'm doing right now, I'm just testing to see how commands and libraries intermix. Normally needed for Go get. And you can go read about it. Go. I'm going to say this again. So Go get was designed to allow modules to be updated, module dependencies to be updated. It was not designed to install stuff. Go install is a proper way to do that. And in 1.17 to 1.18, it's a big deal because that's yeah. the way to do it. Go install is a proper way to do that. And in 1.17 to 1.18, it's a big deal because that's the way to do it. So, but, but the thing to keep in mind is that if you're using the replace directive like this incorrectly, like I am, and you commit it to your source repo, that will stop Go install from working. Period. You use the replace directive in production. And now he got fucking destroyed by 1.17. You can't even install his module anymore by doing that. It's a huge fucking disaster. This whole Go modules thing is a fucking disaster. Yeah, that's it. So, so that's how you fix that problem. If you're getting the, if you re change the replace directive because you left it in an accident and it's still not doing it, there's a good chance that you still are grabbing from the cache uh, out on the Go cache modules and you need to set Go proxy direct. Yeah, Google does cache modules. It, it, it can ruin your day. You're like, I swear to God, I'm fixing this thing. So just set Go proxy direct if you don't want to deal with that. Most of the time it's okay, but Go proxy direct just bypasses it completely. We're going to go ahead and keep doing what we're doing, except for we're going to shoot for support for all three providers, and we're going to create a provider interface, which we started, but we didn't really get too much work on. So we'll have provider interfaces and fluff that'll do VirtualBox, uh, VMware, and Libvirt eventually. Bye.